I want to thank Glenn for that introduction. I want to thank each and every one of you for being present today. I am truly honored to be before the New York State Bar Association to talk about the very important issue of wrongful convictions, an issue that this organization has been grappling with for years, as reflected in the final report by the task force back in 2009. And I'm also truly honored to be here with this outstanding panel. You know, Barry Sheck is a leader in the country on issues of wrongful convictions. Zach Carter, I would not be Brooklyn DA if Zach Carter didn't hire me many years ago as a federal prosecutor in the Eastern District. So I'll always be indebted to Zach. And I know the work that Frank Sedita is doing in the DA Association, leading all 62 of us around the state on this issue. So I just want to speak to you very briefly today about my thoughts on wrongful convictions, the work that we're doing in Brooklyn, and really what's been going on around the country, because I do think that there's a movement that I want to talk, with you, talk to you about this afternoon. It is time that we, as the legal community in New York, address the issue of wrongful convictions. Whether we work in private practice or serve as a judge or as a prosecutor, we all have to deal with this issue because wrongful convictions not only destroy the lives of those who are wrongfully convicted as well as their families, but they also do great damage to the integrity of our criminal justice system. And if people don't have confidence in our justice system, then what is it worth? What good is it? And if you have any doubt that people are starting to lose faith in our system of justice, all you have to do is just look at the tens of thousands of people who have been marching and protesting over the past couple of months throughout the country, from Oakland to Brooklyn. No matter what position you have, whether you agree or disagree with these recent calls for a special prosecutor, here in New York, those calls reflect that public trust is going down in terms of our system of justice, and we have to do something about it. Now, since wrongful convictions go to the very heart of the integrity of our justice system, we cannot ignore them much longer. We have to admit that, our criminal just, that we in the criminal justice system are not infallible that we make mistakes, that mistakes have been made, and that they're made every day in our criminal justice system. And there's no shame in admitting to our mistakes. In fact, there's honor and valor in doing so. But it's not enough to simply admit that there's no perfection in the criminal justice system. We must do more. We must act to correct miscarriages of justice, and to do so with all due deliberate speed. Now, as the Brooklyn DA, I believe that prosecutors must take the lead in correcting wrongful convictions. Prosecutors, because we have our primary duty is not just to convict, but to do justice. And since we are the administrators of justice, we're in the best position. If we don't safeguard the integrity of our criminal justice system, then innocent men and women will be convicted wrongfully, and many guilty people will be wrongfully acquitted. You see, when that happens, we all lose, and when the system fails and, wrong, and people are wrongfully convicted, then, as Glenn said, you have the guilty who remain among us to continue to commit murders and rapes and robberies and continue to terrorize our communities. And so I stand here today proud that as the Brooklyn DA, I'm part of my office as part of a movement around the country of prosecutors who are not only reviewing wrongful convictions, but are actually taking steps to correct miscarriages of justice. Glenn alluded to the National Registry of Exonerations. The other day, they issued its report, and I hope you read it because they said that an unprecedented 125 exonerations occurred throughout our country last year. 
in large part because of prosecutors who were willing to admit that our office has made mistakes. Prosecutors from Dallas to Cleveland to North Carolina to Brooklyn. And out of the 125 exonerations, 67 of those cases were initiated by law enforcement or had our cooperation that led to those convictions being vacated. And Texas, New York, and Illinois are the three states that are leading the country. And I intend to be a leader, not only in Brooklyn and the city, but in the country. Now, when you hear about this number of 125 exonerations last year, I don't want you to just think about those numbers just in terms of pure uh, numbers. Those are lives that were affected. Let me just give you two examples. Barry knows these cases very well. One example involved a, a man named Ricky Jackson. Ricky Jackson was an 18-year-old boy in 1975 who was falsely accused, along with two other young men, of committing a murder of a salesman in Cleveland, Ohio. Now, a little boy, a little 12-year-old boy named Edward Vernon, told the police that he saw Ricky Davis, or I'm sorry, Ricky Jackson, shoot and kill the victim. That was an outright lie. That little boy was on a school bus blocks away from where the murder occurred. But you see, he wanted to be helpful to the police, and he knew Ricky Jackson from his neighborhood. And so he told the police that Ricky Jackson was the, the killer. The police, in return, fed that young boy facts about the murder, which made his account appear even more credible. There was no evidence linking Mr. Jackson or the other two men to the crime. So solely based on that young boy's false testimony, Ricky Jackson and those other two young men were sentenced to death. Ricky Jackson fought for years to prove his innocence, maintained from day one that he had nothing to do with the murder that day. And so Ricky Davis spent almost 40 years of his life in prison for a crime that he did not commit. It was only until that young boy grew up and in his 50s decided to tell the truth, went to his pastor one day and told his pastor that he had been lying all the time. And so Ricky Davis was freed a few months ago. He was freed from prison. He walked out of prison and he said that we were about to be murdered for something that we did not do. Among those 125 exonerees, exonerations also were two mentally disabled half-brothers, Henry Lee McCollum and Leon Brown down in North Carolina. They were falsely accused of raping and murdering an 11-year-old girl in rural North Carolina. They spent 30 years on death row until DNA evidence proved that someone else killed that young girl. And the person who the DNA evidence pointed to was a man who lived only a block away from where the body of the victim was found. And this was a man who had a history of sexual assault convictions and who had confessed to raping and killing another young girl around the same time. But those two men were falsely prosecuted and put in prison because a young kid in the neighborhood pointed fingers at them and when they were interrogated for hours without a lawyer, they ended up signing written confessions, which they later recanted and said were coerced. And so there is, in those 125 cases, lives that have been destroyed that may never be put back together. Now, many of the wrongful conviction cases that were reversed because of prosecutors were reversed because of prosecutors like me who, committed, who created conviction integrity units around the country. These conviction integrity units examine old cases to determine whether justice was done. They started many years ago in Dallas, Texas, and in San Jose, California. Now, I created my own conviction integrity unit. I call it the Conviction Review Unit in Brooklyn. Because upon taking office as Brooklyn DA last year, I inherited a staggering number 
of wrongful conviction claims. About 100 murder convictions had to be reviewed. Now, these were not murder convictions from a couple of years ago. Many of these murder convictions occurred decades ago. And they occurred when New York City was a very different place. For example, last year in Brooklyn, there were 122 murders. But many of you may recall, during the 1980s and 90s, during the crack cocaine epidemic that gripped this city, certain parts of Brooklyn were almost like battlefields. In fact, in 1990, there were 2,200 homicides in the city. And back then, Brooklyn had about 600 homicides itself. And so what was happening back then is that there were so many homicides that the DA's offices were almost being overwhelmed. And because of these horrific crime rates, we're now learning that men in Brooklyn were arrested, put on trial, and imprisoned wrongfully for murders that they did not commit. And so when I had the honor of becoming Brooklyn DA last year, I took over an office that's the third largest DA's office in the country in size behind Los Angeles and the city of Chicago. I have almost 1,200 employees and about 500 prosecutors. But yet, out of 500 prosecutors, only two were assigned to review wrongful conviction claims. And they were given very few resources to do so. And so I began to build a real conviction review unit. And one of the first things I had to do in Brooklyn is I had to go back and forth to the city council to get the funding for my unit because we didn't have the money. And so I convinced the mayor's people and the city council to help us. And now the unit that I have in place, its annual budget is about $1.1 million per year. And out of the 500 prosecutors, I was able to take 10 very senior prosecutors and put them in the conviction review unit. And I put someone who's been prosecuting homicide cases for many years, he has 30 years in the office, 200 jury trials. I put him in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of our conviction review unit. And then I did something else. I was able to convince a very prominent law professor named Ronald Sullivan to come down and serve as my special counsel to oversee this unit and to report to me. Professor Sullivan helped advise President Barack Obama on criminal justice issues when President Obama was running for president. And he's now, Professor Sullivan is now, a, runs Harvard University, he's a law school up there. It's criminal law clinic. So I have Professor Sullivan and I have these great prosecutors who no longer prosecute cases. They come to work every day and they go through the files and they work with a team of investigators that I assigned permanently to the unit. And so what I have done in Brooklyn was also learn from great lawyers like Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld about what they talk about concerning institutional bias. And that led me to create, in addition to the unit, an independent review panel of outside lawyers like Bernie Nussbaum who also review these cases for us, and then they give me written recommendations on what they think I should do, and then I make the final determination. You see, what we do in Brooklyn is we take our time and we embark on a pursuit of the truth. Because everyone who raises their hand and, sw and says that they were wrongfully convicted, they're not speaking the gospel. We know that. And so what we have to do is we take our time, and what we do is we p place a priority on cases that raise issues of actual innocence or due process violations. And we try to interview original witnesses. Sometimes the witnesses have died. Case detectives have died. Trial witnesses have died. But we try to find them. And we literally go throughout the country if we have to, to track someone down. And so we've been to 12 states so far conducting interviews. And what we also do is we work closely with defense attorneys. Anything they want to give us, we look at. Because the goal is to find out 
if someone was truly wrongfully convicted. And so the work we, we started to do, we've been through about 31 cases. And the majority of the cases that we reviewed so far, we're standing by the convictions because there's no reason to disturb them. And some of those convictions involve this detective that Glenn alluded to, Detective Louis Garcella. Some of the cases that we're standing by, he worked on. And there's no reason to disturb the conviction. But there, we have found that there were 11 men who were wrongfully convicted of murder in Brooklyn. And so I moved in the interest of justice to vacate their convictions. Now, some of those men, unfortunately, did not live long enough to see their names clear. They died in prison. That didn't stop me because I felt that we have an obligation to clear their names for their families. And so I just want to give you two examples of cases out of Brooklyn that you might have heard of. One of them involves a guy named Jonathan Fleming, who was put on trial for murder in 1989. Now, Fleming maintained that he didn't commit the murder because he said he wasn't even in Brooklyn at the time. He was in Disney World with his children. And so he asserted an alibi defense. And you know what we did, as great prosecutors do? We fought that defense tooth and nail. And we convicted Jonathan Fleming of murder. But what we failed to do is to tell Jonathan Fleming's attorney that we, when the night he was arrested, the police seized a receipt out of his wallet. And that receipt showed that he had purchased, that he paid for a hotel bill down in Disney World just a few hours before the murder here in Brooklyn. And so we never turned that over to his attorney. And so the jury never saw that evidence. Now, obviously, that was prejudicial. And so without hesitation, we jumped on planes and we went to get Jonathan Fleming from his prison. And we brought him back to Brooklyn. And we moved to free Jonathan Fleming, and we did because we had an obligation to turn over that receipt. And most recently, in October, I moved to vacate the convictions of two 16-year-old boys from Bushwick, David McCallum and Willie Stuckey. They were accused of, at the age of 16, of going to South Ozone Park, Queens, and abducting a man at gunpoint who was getting out of his car in front of his house and driving that man to Brooklyn, and driving him around for hours, and taking his credit card and filling up his car, and then taking him to a secluded location and shooting and killing him, and then driving his car for days around the neighborhood. The problem is there was not a single piece of evidence to link those two young boys to the crime. There was no physical evidence, no, no DNA evidence, no testimonial evidence. There was nothing but their confessions. You see, there were videotaped confessions of those two little boys in the precinct. But there were videotaped confessions like we never saw before. They were perfunctory in nature. They were contradictory. They both pointed the finger at each other. It was as if each kid was told, blame the other one and you can go home. And so those boys were convicted based on that vid the videotaped confessions, which they recanted almost immediately as soon as they got to central booking. Now, we had a choice to make in Brooklyn. Willie Stuckey maintained his innocence for years, just like David McCallum. But Willie Stuckey died of a massive heart attack at the age of 31 while in prison, while maintaining his innocence. So we couldn't save Willie Stuckey. But when I became DA, I got a letter from David McCallum's lawyers asking me to look at his case, and that's what we did. And we determined that those confessions were coerced and that those confessions contained false-fed facts that only the police knew. And so we moved to free David McCallum, who was in prison for almost 29 years. And what I did also is I called Willie Stuckey's mother the night before the court appearance. We had tried to track her down. She had moved out of state. 
and I introduced myself to her. I told her I was a new DA, new Brooklyn DA, and I told her why I was calling. And I told her that Willie should have never been convicted in the first place and that we were going to move to vacate his conviction. All I could hear on the other end of the phone was Willie Stuckey's mother crying uncontrollably. She said she knew from day one that her son did not commit that murder. And when you think about it, no one even took the time to ask themselves whether these 16-year-old poor boys could even drive a car. And how could they drive a car for days around the neighborhood and no one see them? So I asked Willie Stuckey's mother if she would do us the honor of appearing in court the next day in place of her son. And she did so. I thought that was the right thing to do because although we could not give Willie Stuckey back his life, at least we, can give him back, we could give him back his good name. And so I, as the Brooklyn DA, am determined to make sure that we get to the truth in these wrongful conviction cases. And I know that I'm going to be attacked by some, no matter what my decision is. You see, sometimes we have to move to vacate someone's conviction in the interest of justice. And there'll be other times when we have to stand by the conviction and fight a person's effort to get out of prison. Because we can't have an innocent man in prison for a murder that they did not commit. Just like we can't free and release a murderer back into the community just because he claims to have been wrongfully convicted. We have to get it right. And I think we are in Brooklyn. Now, in Brooklyn so far, we've only dealt with wrongful conviction claims that involve the, the charge of murder. The 11 cases that I've moved to vacate all involve murder cases. But we are now going to embark on reviewing wrongful conviction cases that do not involve the crime of murder. We're now going to look at cases of wrongful conviction claims that involve crimes such as gun possession and burglary and the like but we're gonna do so by applying the same principle, and that is to make sure that justice was done. Now, in closing, I wanna say that I established the Conviction Review Unit in Brooklyn for a couple, of primer, a couple of reasons. The main reason is to restore justice, to restore the public's faith in our criminal justice system, and to try to undo the enormous and irreversible damage to try to soften the damage done to the men who were wrongfully convicted. And I understand that some people say, well, what about the financial cost? And I know we have the New York City Corporation Council here. What about all the money that these guys may get from subsequent lawsuits? I have to say, no matter how much money they get, we can't give them back that lost time. We can't give them back relatives who died and children who grew up while they were incarcerated. And so I'm determined to make sure that I clean up the mess that was left for me in Brooklyn, but that's not good enough. I have an obligation to the people of Brooklyn to make sure that we do all we can to prevent wrongful convictions from occurring going forward. And so I am determined to make sure that Brooklyn, that we never get into this position again as an office, because Brooklyn must be a place that is a model for fairness and equal justice, and not a place for where people have been wrongfully convicted for crimes that they did not commit. And so I stand with this association to do all we can as the Brooklyn DA and all we can in this country to do what is right, to protect the public, but to do justice. And so I am grateful to each and every one of you, Glenn, for the opportunity to just say a couple of words. And we don't have all the answers in Brooklyn, but I think we're heading in the right direction. And I think you'll see over the next couple of days and weeks other cases that are gonna come out of the office and they're all designed to make sure that ultimately, as a prosecutor, that we do justice and that we make our criminal justice system better for those who are coming behind us. God bless you all, and thank you so much.